If you will allow me, I'm going to go a little bit out of order tonight and begin the sermon with announcements, or at least one announcement. Don't worry, there will be more announcements later. But the one I wanted to share first is that next week on June 4th, we will observe Pride Shabbat. We even have the slide up. Thank you, Justin. We will acknowledge and we will celebrate our LGBTQ community, and we will do so in person and inside. Now, to allow for social distancing, we will be in our main sanctuary, and pre-registration is required as we are limiting the number of people who may attend. Masks are also required. Next week at the service, this will be our first indoor gathering since COVID began. We will continue indoor worship on select Shabbats throughout the summer. While we are far, far from fully open, next week is the start of something new at Temple. And that means if next week is the start of something new, then this week must be the end of something old, something else. If next week we celebrate our return, then this week we do, well, what exactly? Now I realize it is tempting to say, nothing, we do nothing. Let us just forget about this and stop talking about it already and focus on the future and when will Temple be bring, bringing back the oneg with the communal bowl of veggie dip for us to share? I am sorry to be the bearer of bad news for that last question. Tempting as it is to move on from the pain, the isolation, the collective trauma of these last 14 months, our tradition has a different approach. We do not push away unpleasant feelings and unpleasant events. We name them. We struggle with them. We do not forget them. Sometimes we even turn them into holidays. Think of Hanukkah. Think of Purim. I realize that there are many in our virtual community who have joined us over the last year or so who have never actually been inside our physical building before and may have no idea what our facility looks like besides the 10 square feet that you can see behind me. For those that don't know, our second floor, we have a second floor, it is mostly our religious school. On Sunday mornings, it is usually overflowing with children, which is how most everyone, congregant or not, is used to seeing that space. Throughout the last year, I've gone up there every now and then to see what it looks like. And as you can imagine, it looks a bit different. Now, thanks to our facility staff, the rooms are in pretty good shape. We can see the hallway now. And if you look inside one of the classrooms, what you'll find are desks organized neatly, the chairs pushed in, workbooks stacked in the corner. But there is one thing that has not been touched, the whiteboards. In room after room, the boards are as they were the last time they were used. That was right before Purim, the Purim Carnival. Special schedule that day. The theme of the carnival was frozen. Ironic, I know. Why share these pictures now? It's because these images, they're not going to mean anything, or they're not going to mean the same thing when you look at them a year from now. This COVID time will be compressed, one long, monotonous blur punctuated by an ice storm somewhere in the middle. However it feels to know that it is May 2021 and our religious school is literally frozen in March of 2020, it will feel different once those whiteboards get erased. When we began virtual-only services, we made a conscious choice that we were never going to show the rest of the chapel, of the sanctuary. We were never going to show the empty seats. In such a chaotic, terrifying time, we wanted to present a familiar, normal facsimile of Shabbat, 
even if you were watching from your couch, you could, for 70 minutes each week, you could feel like at least something seemed normal. But now that we are on the other side, I want to show you what it actually has looked like in this chapel for the last 60 or so Shabbats. Hi. For those of us leading services, this, this is routine. But for those seeing this for the first time, well, I'm not sure how it feels. But I do know how I felt the first time I saw this. Here in a historic congregation welcoming Shabbat without congregants, doing it for the first time without congregants in anyone's memory. The word synagogue means gathering place, literally, and here we were in an empty room inside a building with locked doors. I remember exactly how I felt the first time I saw this. It was not a good feeling. But looking at this empty room now, I'll be honest, I feel something else. I feel pride. And I hope you're able to feel that too. We were one of the first major institutions to close in Memphis. It is impossible to know with certainty, but that decision to close, to ungather our gathering space, it likely, possibly, probably saved lives. Not just here, but in other institutions whose leadership had to make the same difficult decision and who perhaps found that decision maybe just a little bit easier or they reached it just a little bit quicker once Temple had decided it was time to close. And again now, at the end of May 2021, having resisted the pressure and the desire, believe me, the desire to fill this room as we have seen the world around us start to reopen. That reticence, that delay, it has again likely saved lives. And again, not just here, but in other institutions who are able to follow Temple's example. It is a mitzvah to gather for Shabbat, to fill a synagogue. But it is an even higher mitzvah to preserve life. We should all be proud that we have upheld this principle throughout the pandemic. To which some people may ask, if it is a mitzvah to preserve life, then why are we letting people come back in now? Why not wait longer? One of my teachers, Rabbi Dr. Devorah Weisberg, once asked us, do you think it's easier when someone comes to a rabbi with a question and asks the rabbi if something is allowed or it's not allowed, do you think it's easier for the rabbi to say yes or no? The answer seems to be yes. Who doesn't like to say yes and who doesn't like to hear yes when they're asking for something? But Rabbi Weisberg argued that it's actually not the case. She used the example of a chicken that based on its organs, bear with me here, based on its organs, it wasn't clear if this particular chicken was kosher or not. So in such a case, you would bring it to the rabbi to make the ruling. Is it easier to say yes, that chicken is kosher, or no, that chicken is not? The rabbi may look at it and conclude, despite whatever blemish it has, this chicken is, is perfectly kosher, but the person may walk away thinking, does the rabbi really know what the rabbi is talking about? Does the rabbi really take kashrut, keeping kosher, all that seriously? That person might walk away with their chicken and share their suspicions. The other rabbi in town might say, well, if that rabbi wants to eat it, good for that rabbi, but me, I would never touch a chicken that looked like that. I prefer to be diligent when it comes to following the law. Oof. It's actually not that easy to say yes. It can be easier to say no. 
Better to say the chicken isn't kosher and be known as the strict, serious, learned rabbi than risk the consequence of being seen the opposite way. Except the chicken is kosher. It's fine. Even if it feels a little suspect, it is okay to eat it. Why are we allowing people back into our building instead of waiting even longer? Because our medical consultants have told us it is safe to do so, even if it might not feel quite right, might not feel like what we have all become used to during the last period of isolation, it is okay. It is safe. Even if it would, in some ways, be easier to say, let's just wait a little longer. As we come back over the coming weeks, there will be joy. The Megillah that we started last March, it ends now with us overcoming this pandemic. That is reason to celebrate. But these coming weeks won't be joyful for everyone. It is also going to be a difficult period for many. Thank God this is all over, we toast and we exclaim. But what about the person who buried their spouse, their parent, the person who never got to say goodbye? What about the person who spent days or weeks isolated in a hospital room, having no idea if they were ever going to leave it? What about the person who had to choose between risking their health or their paycheck? What about so many people with so much pain? Even if the pandemic ends, the pain does not. To those who don't feel like there is much to celebrate at this time, I speak on behalf of the temple community and the clergy when I say we are here for you. And for those who cannot wait to pick up where you left off, please remember to care for those among us who are hurting. And for those who are insisting that they are fine, it's been fine, it's fine, when it hasn't been fine. Tonight, I showed you a different side of temple. I showed you the reality of what temple has looked like that has been here this whole time, but has also been hidden. And I hope that it inspires you to be honest about what this period has been like for you. Not the side that we all present out of necessity or habit, but the reality of what this time has looked like. I am sure there are people who truly, really are fine. That's okay. But I know for many of us, there are complicated feelings and emotions that deserve to be processed and need to be for us to be able to move on. What is it that we are supposed to feel on the final of more than 60 continuous virtual Shabbats? I can't really say because there is no one feeling, nor is it my place to suggest one. But it is important it is worth naming, recognizing, and processing that the end of something old is a period worth thinking about and worth realizing. We are not on the eve of something new. We are, but we are also marking the end of something we have all gone through together, alone and together. And with that, I look forward to welcoming folks in person, those who are able to attend next week and virtually, our virtual services will continue even as we begin to have in-person services. So folks are welcome to join us either way, however they feel comfortable. Kenya Hiratson, may it be God's will.